machine. All right. So I think we're going to get things started. And with that, we'll pass the mic on. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> Yay for our new fun space, ITP. Thanks. <laughs> So we're excited to be hosted here for a lot of reasons, um, and not the least of which is that we get to um, to have people from the, the natural environment, creatures of the natural environment joining us, um, and some alumni and so on. Um, so for those of you who are new to StoryCode, which I don't think there are a lot of you, um, just a quick word about who we are. So StoryCode is um, an organization that convenes people like you, people who are interested in story, the convergence of story and technology across all platforms, and um, who are interested in experimentation, sharing their experimentation, and connecting with other people like them. So um, we welcome people who are doing for-profit, non-profit, you know, for money, for not money, for love, for hate, whatever. Like, as long as you're experimenting and you're having fun, we want to have you here. Um, we have a monthly newsletter that we send out, which is basically a compilation of what we see out there that's the latest and the greatest. If you're interested, it's always fun to keep track of what projects are happening. Um, go to the Story Code site, sign up for the newsletter. It's awesome. Um, and finally, the other thing I just wanted to mention is that we are looking, we routinely look for volunteers to help us on various fronts, on research. We are not a, a funded organization. We work very lightly in a kind of more, like I said, convening kind of arrangement rather than a um, sort of a grant making or, or heavier nonprofit. So we rely on you, volunteers and uh, people who are willing to help. So we're often looking for people to do various things from helping us on social to um, compiling stuff in the newsletter. Um, if you're ever interested in running a video camera during during events, if you're interested in doing that, please come talk to us, email us, inatstorycode.org, mikeatstorycode.org. So thank you all for coming and I'll pass it on to Mike. Thanks, Anna. Uh, we've got a full slate for tonight, so let's dive in. So first off, um, we have um, Ryan Jones and Mark Catalano, uh, who developed a project called The Dobbs Stories. Um, most of you probably have seen this, but if you haven't, it's a really uh, moving piece of immersive media. Um, Fast Company called it a uh, beautiful multimedia newspaper uh, and an evolving online documentary. Uh, it's just an amazing project, and we're really excited to welcome uh, Mark and Ryan to present this project. And hopefully, we can learn uh, learn kind of uh, from the process. And uh, welcome. Hello. Thanks. Uh, so I'm Ryan Jones. I'm the director. Uh, I think I wore a lot of hats on this project, but director probably sums it up best of uh, the Dow stories. And uh, as Mike mentioned, it's a multimedia website. And I guess the best place to really start uh, is to kind of give you a little bit of framework as to exactly what Dadab is. So Dadab is currently the world's largest refugee camp. It's located in the Horn of Africa in Kenya. And it is home to around 500 million refugees. 98% uh, of those are Somali refugees but there are also uh, Sudanese, uh, Ethiopians as well, uh, all living in uh, a very small space, but is actually the third most populous uh, city in all of Kenya. And none of them are Kenyan residents, they're all displaced people. So um, it's there that we kind of set our story. And within Dadaab, there's an organization that I work with uh, called Filmaid International, and Filmaid is the organization that sponsored the Dob Stories facilitated it. And uh, I've been working with Filmate for um, around two or three years. What Filmate does is they work in a variety of developing nations, uh, places that are war torn, struck by natural disasters, places like Haiti, Japan, uh, the Horn of Africa, and other places like that. And what Filmate does is, for one, they provide entertainment for people. One of the things that we've realized is that in refugee camps and war-torn areas, the, a lot of the physical needs are being met by various organizations, food, shelter, water, sanitation, but psychological needs are also a huge issue, and just filling the day for people can be a real challenge. 
So Film Aid brings movies into the camp, which might seem like a simple thing, but it's actually very profound to give people a psychological outlet, whether that's watching an infor informative documentary about HIV prevention or watching The Wizard of Oz. And so that's one of Film Aid's roles uh, in Dadaab. But also we facilitate a workshop where we uh, lead a group of refugees in classes where they learn how to make their own movies and tell their own stories and create informational films for the camp of half a million people. And in Dadaab, this is especially important because when Dadaab was created, it was a space that was made for 20,000 people, and again, now it holds half a million. So the old forms of communication don't work anymore. The idea of having block leaders that the various aid organizations communicate with, then those block leaders communicate to their community the messages that those organizations have for them. So with the numbers of people that they have there now, that just doesn't work. So Film Aid creates movies that can be shown on a large scale to the community and get appropriate information out to the community that way. And our refugee filmmakers uh, write, produce, shoot, edit those movies so that it's stories and information for their community by their community. And it's in that space that the Dob Stories was really uh, created. Um, and before we go into that, I want to show you just a quick clip that kind of will demonstrate in images exactly how film made is at work in the Dob. Lots of information spread by the various agencies on their respective um, um, activities and services. Um, so there is, to a certain extent, an overflow of information. Communication for the new arrivals is a bit challenging because these are people who are just coming in, they have no idea how systems in this place work. And they're coming in and say, high numbers that we can't reach them with their, the old form of communication. Working with Filmade and other partners in this area is, is, is crucial to inform the refugees on their rights, also their entitlements, and on the existing services and the camps. In Dada, the largest refugee camp in the world, receiving information can be a matter of life and death. Filmade communicates with the diverse refugee population in the universal language of images. If we have movies and uh, Philips, then it will improve a lot in passing this information to the community. We need the mass media to be able to attract people. And once they get there, it's easier to pass the messages we want to pass to them in a more entertaining way. If we can get help from partners, for instance, like FilmAid, to really explain that what we give them is the basic requirement. That is very important. Information is given, but it's given verbally to a large group of people. And I think if you can make that um, into film, then that's a good opportunity to get information out there. The film that was done by Thurman on resettlement brought some clarity and some transparency um, to the refugees, knowing, okay, this, these are the procedures, this is expected from you, but these are also your rights. And I think that really helped all of us a lot. And again, they use the same people from the refugee community to do the film, which makes it easier because they find them the message like they are coming from their own people. We understand the basic problem because it's something that happened to us. The youth that Filmate is working with are a huge asset for the work of UNHCR because these are mostly youth that have been here for many, many years, so they know the camps very well. They are very engaged, very active. So what film aid does is listen to what the community has, come back to film aid, make film out of it, and then show so that the information should not be distorted. In times of crisis, film aid is on the ground, spreading the information that people need most, changing lives, saving lives. So, all of that is to really kind of demonstrate that FilmAid has been there for seven years working with these refugees uh, and they are creating content all of the time. And so the Dom stories really came about, um, it was conceptualized in uh, 2011, the summer of 2011. I was actually there for six weeks uh, working in the Dom, working with a group of refugees and my colleague Rafiq Copeland who works with FilmAid 
um, had this concept of actually creating a space to house all of this content so that it wasn't just in the refugee camp anymore. It wasn't something that, though it was serving a great purpose to the refugee community, it could also be serving a great purpose to the world at large. And so the Dobbs Stories was really created um, in, as a way to give these refugees a voice, a larger megaphone out to the world, and simultaneously and reciprocally to create a way for the world at large to understand what life in the world's largest refugee camp is like, and therefore to really kind of understand what the refugee experience is as a whole. And so we were lucky enough to receive funding from the Tribeca New Media Fund and the Ford Foundation, and Film Aid also supplemented uh, funding as well so that we could kind of get up off the ground and start working. And this was a true international initiative. We had you know, teams spanning three continents. It was Americans, Kenyans, Somalis, Ethiopians, Australians, um, even like a Spanish guy back there. So I like, really covered the gamut. Um, and, and all of this was done, started, we actually started work in February of 2012, and we had several objectives in mind. Um, for one, as I said, we wanted to give voice to the voiceless. It was great that these refugees were able to reach their community, but we really wanted that to expand and overflow into the world at large. And then, again, to bring greater awareness to the issue of Dadaab and the refugee population as a whole. Because so often what happens is you hear about these stories in times of crisis, and when there's nothing going on, uh, these refugees still exist in their camps and are stuck there. And we wanted to tell stories about how the refugees were living and how they were making the most of their situation. And it was very important to us that this not be a fundraising tool. We really wanted it to be strictly to spread the message and share these people's experience and give them a place to share their experiences. And as a result, we were really looking for stories that weren't typical. Not, you know, I came to this camp, it was so terrible in my home country, and war, and famine, and all of this. Those stories exist in the Dobbs stories, but what we really try and focus on are the unexpected stories, things that you wouldn't expect to find in a refugee camp. And we're going to go into that more a little bit later. But when we started actual production on the Dobbs stories, uh, we faced a lot of obstacles. And um, we pretty much immediately, when we got approved uh, from the Tribeca New Media Fund, we, there was a kidnapping in the Dobbs. Uh, two MSF workers were kidnapped, still hadn't been recovered, but it resulted in massive security um, tightening throughout the camp which made our job very difficult. And from that point on, there were bombings, there were shootings, there were kidnappings, and what seemed like was going to be a six-month uh, production schedule suddenly stretched into a year, a year and a half. And so the story of Dadaab's story is really starting to parallel the story of Dadaab itself, where we weren't able to get into the camp because they were on lockdown. We weren't able to get equipment out to our refugees to shoot because they weren't able to move around in the camp without being in danger. And uh, eventually we were able to push through these things and we launched in April and um, it was all worthwhile and all really came together despite all of these obstacles and really was a testament to the perseverance of our team on the ground there in Dadaab that we were able to uh, get all of these stories out despite the overall story that was existing there in the camp at the time. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to our lead developer, Mark Catalano of Ronick, and he's gonna talk a little bit about the design and development of the site. Thanks, Ron. Hi, I'm Mark. I, uh, I'm one of the founding partners at Ronick. Um, Phil Maid had come to us uh, looking for help to, to understand sort of how to tell this story, uh, and it was a, a great challenge that we sort of wanted to, to take on. Um, so one of the biggest problems that, that we sort of faced early on in, in the process was just the sort of the amount and the kinds of content that we were, that we were uh, tasked with organizing and finding a way to, to, sh to tell sort of a story to people uh, without it being overwhelming, without it being sort of overbearing. Um, and remaining something where people could 
experience uh, this content and these videos and these stories without uh, without feeling like they like too much content was being pushed on top on, onto them. So initially, we were up going to launch the site with around 100 videos, uh, and the videos were sort of everywhere in file servers, and some of them were on YouTube, and it was a big challenge just to sort of catalog and understand the kind of content, the kinds of videos, and the kinds of imagery that we had. Luckily, Ryan had spent, said, like Ryan had said, he had spent six weeks into dub and he had shot a lot of uh, still imagery and, and done a lot of uh, video making with the refugees while he was there, so he was a great asset to be part of the, uh, part of the concepting team that, that was involved. So we had come up with a plan for how we wanted to display display uh, these videos. We decided on uh, a layout that was very vertical. Uh, we, we knew that we wanted the site, or initially we thought the site was going to be multiple pages. Uh, and you were going to have video pages with related videos and related content, and there was going to be different ways to navigate between pages. Uh, so we had started off with this design, and this was sort of where we began. Uh, very vertical, anchor-based imagery. We, we liked this layout. We felt like we could sort of begin here. Uh, after sort of mulling this over in our minds a little bit, we realized that we had created something that was very, um, uh, very media driven. We had all come from an, an environment where we were uh, coming straight from big media companies and, uh, and journalism, and we sort of got in this mindset that what we were doing was we were creating a multimedia website. You can sort of see it here. The colors are very um, sort of subdued. We've got a lot of black. Uh, backgrounds and stuff for multimedia driven content. We also sort of, we even missed sort of some of the point of what we were trying to do. Uh, and we used this image up here of this, um, of this, uh, one of the filming workers actually on top of one of the trucks shooting, uh, shooting some stills of every, everyone. So we had sort of missed the, the mark of, in some way in this first iteration. Uh, you know, it wasn't, right from the top we sort of missed the idea that this was about the refugees. So we, we started again. And we wanted to find a way to pull out the story into the design, and so we ended up we end up here, uh, which is not so different from where we began. Uh, but what we realized was that the imagery that we had, uh, that Ryan had shot, shot a lot of the, this imagery, was just so vibrant and so colorful. And we wanted to we decided that pulling that um, pulling those colors out into the rest of the site was a, a great way to bring the stories themselves into, um, into the design of the site and sort of open up, open everything up so that it felt uh, much more alive, and less serious, less profound, much more, um, much more reflective of the, the things we were actually seeing. So we, our goal was to sort of make an environment uh, where people could discover this content and discover these stories uh, without it, without it, uh, an, an experience being too guided. Uh, it was supposed to be. It's supposed to be an experience where you can kind of meander through content and uh, and find your own way. Uh, so let me just show you a quick uh, walkthrough of how the site works, just in case you haven't seen it. We started up top with this big full bleed video carousel. Uh, we had some information that we wanted people to understand and, and to know about the camp. There was some basic stuff that we wanted to communicate via um, text and copy. Uh, and we started doing that by placing the placing flat uh, copy up, up, up above the fold in that header area. And that was really, we realized sort of that that was very flat, very, a very flat experience and we weren't leading with our best foot forward. We had all this great video content and all this incredible moving imagery that we weren't really taking advantage of. So we decided that we would incorporate the, the video multimedia element of the rest of the site into that header area. And we ended up, I think, creating a header experience, an experience that is an introduction to the site without feeling like a separation from the from the actual content that we're that we're uh, that's being created by these refugees. Uh, we used a lot of video loops in order to, to do that, and it creates an experience I think where you're absorbing, you're hopefully absorbing the, the text and you're reading, um, and but you're encouraged to move through this experience and to actually do that just because of how captivating and how interesting the moving images are in, in the header. 
So you can see that the page is sort of this, uh, this single page design that scrolls. And then this is sort of a, this is sort of the page kind of opened up and laid out. We wanted everything to be very vertical as you move down through the refugee content, and our content to be in that uh, horizontal plane, uh, just to sort of keep the different kinds of content separated. So it's a very light division between uh, between introductory introduction, which is something that we're creating, and refugee, which is something that's being created by uh, uh, in collaboration with us. So, yeah, again, we have a variety of different stories, and within the site there are several kind of headings that you can explore, whether it's camp life or camp services. Um, uh, even we did a lot of work with the diaspora community trying to show, even once people leave the camp, what that kind of experience is like. And as I said earlier, we were really trying to find unconventional stories. We didn't want it to be, you know, what's life in the malnutrition ward, or you know, the standard images of flies buzzing around people's head. Because, to be honest, that's not what you see a lot out there. Having spent six weeks out there during the height of the Somali famine crisis, I barely saw that at all. Mostly what you see is a group of people that have been there for decades sometimes. And they are thriving there, they're making their lives uh, the best that they can. They're getting married, they're starting football leagues, they have businesses, it's a thriving community with a actually very big economy. So we have stories like about a guy that has his own music studio and he's a producer and he has people come in and they lay down tracks. We have a story about the refugee newspaper which is a, an actual newspaper that the refugees themselves started. They write all the content, they take all the photos and FilmAid facilitates it getting printed and then they distribute it around the camp. It's just another news source. So there's a video about that. There's a story about the economy and um, all of the different businesses and shops in the camp. Um, we have this story about the camel market, which is something that has actually never been seen outside of the camp. And even our refugee filmmakers had to pull a lot of strings and do a lot of fast talking in order to get into this camel market and talk to the guy that, you know, sells hundreds of camels to the camp community. Um, so these are the stories that we're really trying to push out there because we wanted it, when people landed on the site, first of all we wanted them to be immersed in the content, hence what Mark was talking about earlier with the motion graphics and the large full screen imagery, but then we wanted them to see things that would really pique their curiosity and not just be the same fare of like, oh feel bad for these people, it's so rough. It is, it is rough, but these are people that are persevering despite the conditions that they're living in and we really wanted to demonstrate that accurately. So I'll talk briefly about uh, some of the, I don't know how interested everyone is in development, yes. uh, but I'll talk briefly about some, some of the things that we, some of the tools that we use and some of the techniques that we use to sort of build, uh, to sort of build the app story. So, um, the when we when we had first sort of accepted this challenge to, to build adopt stories, we, we knew right away that we wanted to focus primarily on building a, a very rich front end experience. So that was what was sort of driving all the decisions that uh, uh, that were behind some of the some of the ideas that we had. So one of the mo I think one of the most interesting things about this site um, is that it's actually backed all by Tumblr posts. So everything on the site, including its hosting, is all provided on Tumblr. So it doesn't look like a regular Tumblr, I think, uh, and that's by that's on purpose. But it's actually all backed by Tumblr posts. So what we did was we actually used we, we did that for two reasons for a couple reasons. The first reason was because we wanted to focus on uh, developing spending the most amount of time that we could developing a uh, a really solid front end experience. That meant we didn't need to worry about a back end. We didn't need to worry about a CMS. We didn't need to worry about uh, building something that was easy for uh, for Ryan to use, for and for refugees to use once the keys get kind of handed over to them, and they uh, and they can start posting some of this and maintaining this on their own. Um, 
so we built everything on top of, on top of Tumblr. Uh, it was it was relatively fast, just from like a developer point of view. It was very fast, very easy to to implement, and Tumblr provides a, a very useful API for getting a lot of data out and manipulating in, in ways that you need that you want to manipulate things. Uh, so using Tumblr as a backend, very uh, maybe very risky. Uh, we weren't sure what was going to happen with Tumblr at the time, uh, but it ended up giving us a good lever to, to, to focus on other things. Um, another group reason why we decided to, to use Tumblr as a backend was because we wanted to kind of kickstart the, um, the idea that this was a storytelling experience. And we wanted to let, we, we sort of wanted to leverage a community that was already really interested in telling stories and do, already doing it really well. And the Tumblr community does that. I mean, everybody knows, everybody sort of, there's like a good saying like, oh, there's probably a Tumblr for that. You know, there's like, you know, everybody, there's a Tumblr for everything. And now there's a Tumblr for this. Um, so I'll show you sort of, I mean, this is just a, our Tumblr dashboard. And it's super easy for, you know, for whoever's entering a new content to, to do this. Uh, what you see on, um, on, the, on the right here is actually the refugee uh, news, which is a, a companion site to the Dadaab stories and something that we built simultaneously along, uh, along with Dadaab stories. And this, uh, this is just, this is a much more regular looking Tumblr. And the idea behind the refugee news is that it's a place for, um, for the content that's normally in print inside the actual refugee news newspaper to exist online. And this allows more people to access it. Um, surprisingly, this is one of the things that we've, we, I thought was amazing and one of, the, one of the reasons, one of the most interesting things technologically about all of this and didn't relate really to this project was that, but that the refugees utilize cell phones for tons of information sharing and communication. And it was sort of amazing to, to find that out, to find out that not only were they just using the, sort of the basics of cell phones, which is like SMS, but they were using that to gain access to services that are much more powerful. Like they, they use their uh, cell phones as a gateway to Facebook, uh, which, was, which was like amazing to me. And Ryan was telling me how uh, he's getting Facebook messages from cell phones into Dob from, from refugees on the ground, which was sort of an incredible thing. Uh, so we, uh, we were sort of sparked to life by this idea that social media could be used, these social media channels could be used um, with very light technology. Uh, so that's sort of the idea behind building, some of the idea behind building all this on top of Tumblr so that, uh, and Ryan will talk about this later, some of the future plans for, for where, some, where some of this technology is gonna go. Um, we built the site to be very responsive. So when we found out about that cell phone thing and the fact that, uh, that people were using their cell phones to, to get access to all this content, while we weren't prepared to build a, a website that would look awesome on like a, a regular feature phone, uh, we did want to make sure that the site was available on as many devices as possible. Uh, so we used a bunch of responsive uh, design techniques in order to make sure that this thing looked, looked good on uh, de regular desktops, tablets and, and mobile devices. And the way that we did that was uh, through lots and lots of media queries. I think everybody's really familiar with that. Um, if you've built a responsive site, I mean, to, to make it really look great on, in lots of different angles and lots of different uh, uh, orientations, it's like a lot of media queries. So, so to do some of that, I mean, we utilize like SAS. This was a big SAS project. There's a lot of, there's a, there's a lot of uh, SAS for CSS that's happening in the background. Um, we used uh, HTML5 video player for the entire full screen video experience. And that allowed us to basically uh, say, are you capable of running video? If you are, then we're gonna show you this awesome video. If you're not, then we're gonna show you um, still imagery. And that's how we actually preload a lot of the video. So what we do is we, uh, what we do, what we do is we say, uh, you know, show everybody this still image, and then once the video loads, we can actually play it. So you get a nice, ex you get a nice loading experience where you're not really waiting for that thing to happen. It sort of just starts, and you're pleasantly surprised. Um, another big lifesaver for this project, and I would recommend this for every anyone who's developing any um, project that's heavily based on the front end, is to use a, a build platform. Uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with what that is, but we use uh, Grunt JS, which is an excellent. Uh, JavaScript and Node-based uh, uh, build tool, which allowed us to 
not waste a lot of time moving code around and, uh, and, build, and building a project for production. So whenever there were changes, we, it was it's very easy to make a change in a, when, you have, when you're using a build tool to an environment where you can make code changes and then push those out rapidly. Um, so if you have any questions about Grunt later, I guess we can address that. And then I'll just go over the, the numbers on the site real quick. So uh, we, we wanted to kickstart the, 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 we kickstarted the project on um, Tumblr because we wanted to build a follower base. Uh, and I think we achieved that like pretty rapidly. We had achieved like a 10,000 person following uh, without, I mean, without tons and tons of um, promotion outside of Tumblr itself. Uh, so without any kind of external promotion besides what we were uh, what we were doing inside of Tumblr. Uh, Tumblr was helping us uh, by providing link back, links back to this blog, but we were getting followers just based on uh, based on the content that we were providing. In, I think in users' dashboards, people were pretty excited about it. Uh, so we had we had 22,000 unique visitors. They viewed the site 28,000 times, and we've got 10,000 followers, which we can now leverage um, to do more things with. And, uh, Hopefully, we'll be able to turn more, some of those followers that are on the DOPS page into followers of the Refugee News, uh, so they can see content that's uh, even more uh, local to what's happening in the camp all the time. Yeah, so, as Mark mentioned, uh, just kind of in closing, looking at where we're going from here, uh, we do have this companion site, the Refugee News, and. Uh, whereas we have the 10,000 followers for Dadaab stories, the followers for Refugee News are somewhat lacking. And so we're kind of starting to work on a phase two operation that will really drive traffic to the Refugee News because that's going to be the site that the refugees are much more directly interacting with. And uh, we want to create uh, a more active audience for them uh, when that happens. So part of the phase two plan, what we're working on now in order to drive more traffic in that direction is we're uh, in talks with Tumblr, uh, partnering between Filmate and Tumblr to take actually um, a trip out to Kenya with a group of people from Tumblr and a couple people from Filmate to do basically a workshop with the refugees where we will train them on uh, Tumblr and other social media that they might not be using, things other than Facebook. Um, we want to bring over a couple of dozen iPhones so that they can be out in the field shooting high quality imagery just with their phones, video, photo, editing on their phones and getting it uploaded and putting it on the refugee newspaper site so that they're not having to wait for a new issue of the refugee newspaper. They can be doing it on the fly and the followers can be seeing that. So the trip is actually twofold. For one thing we want to do it as a training exercise but it's also a great kind of public relations opportunity to kind of draw media attention and say, look, Tumblr is going out there and training refugees how to use their tool. Facebook isn't doing that. Twitter isn't doing that. Um, this is something that will be a uniquely Tumblr initiative. Um, so that's kind of the plan moving forward. Um, we're very excited with what we've been able to accomplish just in you know less than two months of being online. Uh, that follower count on Tumblr is just unbelievable for that amount of time. And uh, to think that this is what we've done in two months, it's very exciting to think where we will be able to go from here. So um, thank you very much uh, for listening. And yes, if you have any questions. Well, um, the, the question is, with the continuous flow of refugees, how does that affect resources and the project moving forward? Uh, actually, that's something that they've got pretty well under control right now. The, the nice thing about Dadaab is that it has existed for 25 years, so the uh, aid organizations that are there have been there for decades. And uh, two years ago, while I was there, was when there was a massive um, onslaught of refugees where a thousand were coming in every day and those numbers have gone down um, in the past
past year or so. Uh, there's still a large number of people coming in every day, but the camp has adjusted to it, and there's plenty of um, organizations that are working out there and resources that are being directed out there. And Film Aid has been there for about seven years as well, and so they know how to handle that. And so it's it's that's not really the problem. We have more problems with security and you know Al Shabaab coming in and bombing and shootings and kidnappings and that kind of thing. That's really the thing that inhibits this project more than anything. And unfortunately, it's just something that we have no control over. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so this one Um, 
there are schools in the camp and they teach uh, English as part of the curriculum. Um, it was very rare when I was out there to, inter to encounter somebody that didn't have some level of English. Uh, that clip that I showed you um, is more for the outside world than um, for the camp itself. That's why it's in English. It's meant to kind of demonstrate what life in the camp is like and, and what Film Aid is doing in the camp. Uh, so that's why that's in English. But the, the films that the refugees are making and a lot of the ones that you'll see on the DOP stories are in Somali or are in the Gambela uh, language. Uh, which is the Ethiopian uh, tribe that is in large part in Dadaab. And, um, and those films on Dadaab stories are subtitled in English. Um, but the, the films that are made in the camp, uh, for the camp, are done in the native language. Yes? What about the capacity building that you're doing in terms of, you know, when people are telling their own story and you're giving them, you're sharing the tools that you use and having them build their capacity and skill sets, how, is there any way that you are documenting um, how that's helping them in, in realistic terms, in terms of getting jobs or expanding their skills? Is that being documented? Is that being done by FilmAid or you? or And any, anything else in terms of capacity building? Sure. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult um, to show results for that because people don't leave the camp often. I mean, of the people that I worked with in Dadaab, uh, only one has gotten out, and it's a very. I don't necessarily mean that getting out is is an improvement. Oh yeah, no, no, no. But but <laughs> sure. But going to the point of them being able, it's that is our goal. Is that when they when they leave, they do have a skill set and and hopefully uh, a passion for storytelling in some way, whether that's in journalism or uh, filmmaking or photography or poetry or any of the other. Uh, arts that Film Aid kind of helps to facilitate. Um, and it's, it, we just haven't been able to actually see that um, in the real world because it takes years for, you know, a lot of our filmmakers have been in the camp for uh, their entire lives, 20, 25 years. And um, so we've yet to see that kind of come to fruition. We have had um, some of our filmmakers uh, gain like scholarships where they're able to leave the camp um, basically kind of on furlough basically where they can leave the camp and go to a class for a month or go to another area of the country and, and take a workshop or that kind of thing uh, because of what they've done with Film Aid. Um, and hopefully when some of our, uh, our filmmakers start to kind of matriculate and get resettled, we'll be able to see that they're able to take those skills and bring them out into the real world. Yes? What is the refugee status of the residents mean for their political and civic engagement and opportunities for participating in the political process? Um, you know, they, they're not Kenyan citizens, so they can't participate in the Kenyan government or elections at all. They do have um, kind of community governments. They have, you know, chair, chair people in various districts, and they hold elections for that kind of thing. Um, but their political engagement, they're really stuck in limbo. You know, they can't participate in their home country um, in a political way because it's not safe for them to be there. They are simultaneously not citizens of their host country, so they can't participate there as well. Um, so the best that they can do is really kind of follow it and see what's going on. And they are very actively engaged in the news and knowing what's going on in Somalia or Ethiopia or South Sudan. But that's unfortunately uh, kind of the reality of the fact that that's as far as they can go. Uh -huh. So capacity in terms of like uploading more and more um, videos, um, I'm really curious about that because um, you talked about coming from a mass media or big media company, you know, like the first interface was more like, like that. And so like, you know, what's the capacity? Because I'm certain that they're turning out several videos, you know, a week and whatnot. Yeah, it's, um, you know, the, the content flow, it, it kind of ebbs and flows depending on the security situation. Right now we're in a little bit of a dry spell as far as content creation for video content. And, um, but as that comes in, they actually do, the goal is to basically 
as Mark said, kind of hand the keys over to them so that they have the capability to upload themselves. And again, Filmate is there full time and they have the steady internet connections and the staff there to facilitate the uploading of content and getting that online. So ideally, moving forward, we will be able to uh, have them uploading content more frequently and getting that up there. But again, the nice thing is having it built on Tumblr, it's incredibly easy to, you know, with a few simple clicks, get a video onto YouTube and then link that video into a Tumblr post and it goes right into that front end beautifully. So it's something that is very easily trainable. My mom could do it. No offense to my mom, but uh, she can. Yes. So, so your videos are hosted on YouTube? Yes, the, all the, there's a Dob Stories YouTube channel where all the videos are housed and then uh, they are linked into Tumblr posts which then lead into the front end of the site. I'm just uh, wondering how expensive it is to maintain it. Um, sort of make it more, more places. Do you have financing, I suppose, in place for like long term? Yeah, that's actually something that we're figuring out and, and I'll let Mark speak a little bit more to this. Um, but we were surprised at the response that we got when we launched, that we were not expecting the numbers that we got traffic-wise. Um, and I'm actually going to let Mark talk a little bit about uh, the numbers and kind of the cost of maintaining that. So we, um, everything that's not hosted by Tumblr is backed by an S3 bucket right now. And so that's sort of the static content that lives on the site. So, that isn't really a sustainable option for the long term, but it was a solution for the short term for how to get content up and how to get it hosted in a, in, in a place that it can live and be served in a, in a fast enough manner to make sure that the site responds well. Um, so the, expen the ongoing spe expenses are really that one file, one file source that we need in order to in order for the for those static assets that can't live inside of Tumblr to exist. Um, but everything else is hosted by Tumblr or, or YouTube, so there's no real ongoing server costs outside of the static assets. And static assets are crazy expensive to maintain, um, but we, we maintain them for now. Uh, and then they'll be moved onto a server, onto a FTP server that's more of an unlimited use sort of Is that full time? Sort of maintaining the moment? No, no, it's not full time. I mean, it's been running for a while without having to, to change any code or make any real adjust, code adjustments to, to the site. It's very, it's running on its own right now. Um, and then the idea is that new content comes in and posts are put in through Tumblr. So we wanted to have like zero server administration and that's part of the, that was definitely part of the reason why we went with Tumblr because they do a lot of the, I mean they do a lot of the hosting for you. That said, Tumblr's had some outages and we, on the launch day that we had with Tumblr, we definitely had, we, they, that's when they had their they, like, denial of um, service attack where they were like, they had a DNS flood that brought down all their servers and uh, that brought us down too. Um, but I'd rather leave the keys in their hands because they're monitoring all the time rather than, uh, you know, have somebody at Filmade that needs to monitor it or have somebody at Filmade and need to pay for somebody else to monitor the site. Uh, we have like some automated tools that make sure that, that everything is up. I mean, there's ping them just to make sure that the server doesn't go down. Or when the server goes down, somebody gets notified, and then we just fix it. Uh, or we, we call somebody. Uh, we have like a community representative of the Tumblr that we can we can speak with and just make sure that everything is you know correct. But I think Tumblr just got bought by Yahoo, so hopefully they'll be around for a little while and uh, <laughs> and we'll be fine. Uh, hopefully it doesn't go like delicious or up. Flicker. <laughs> oh, but Flickr gives you like a terabyte of free. Photos, yeah, so that should make you happy. <laughs> Are we time? Two more questions. Okay. Um, since it's so popular, have you looked at the sort of volume of where the, the chatter interest is? Why is still why are the people who are interested in it sharing and passing along in terms of you know sort of editorial chatter? I mean, I think that. Um, I don't know about you, I haven't really seen exactly uh, why we can see numbers. Um, as far as the Tumblr engagement, it's 
it's mostly just reblogs. I haven't seen much commentary uh, regarding that, but um, you know, I think that well, I could be biased, but what I like to think is that they're uh, you know seeing things that they don't expect. Again, these are stories that are uncommon and kind of surprising, and I think that's why people are engaging with it so much because I mean that's kind of the key to the internet, isn't it? Is that with content, you have to be showing something new and exciting and interesting. And if you're not, then there are a million other places that you can click away to. So um, I like to think that the 10,000 follower count and the traffic numbers are because people are actually coming and seeing something that they're not expecting. It's, it's not a cat playing the piano, but you know, it's, it's something. So it might be inspiring. Sure. I mean, yeah. I, I, I really, I couldn't say, but you know, I hope it's inspiring. That, that would be my hope. Um, I think he... Yeah. The the question is, uh, is there any moderation? And yes, at this point, um, especially with the Dadab stories as a site on a, on a, as a whole, uh, we do have a space where we are accepting. Um, uh, submissions for content. We really want to reach out more to the diaspora community to get their stories and um, so we have kind of like a little blurb at this point on the site that kind of says, you know, do you have a story to tell? Um, send us a link to a YouTube video or a poem or something like that and we will look it over and if it's something that we feel fits with our slate then we'll put it in. But it's, it's not a, just a free-for-all at this point in time because again we are really trying to control the content just in terms of um, again being the kind of stories that people are going to want to interact with and not the typical stories that you see every day. One last question. The, the, I wanted to add one thing, sorry. The, the idea behind the refugee news site is that it'll be a group Tumblr uh, where refugees will have their own Tumblrs, and then they'll be contributing under their own name to the to the group Tumblr, which is the refugee news. Uh, and that that's not how it's set up right now, but that's the idea. Uh, once more control can be can be handed over to them, and they have more tools to to be able to contribute content more regularly. Uh, what's the life shortest and longest episode you've ever seen? Um, let's see. The longest. Well, we have a uh, a short. This is kind of contradictory. We have a short feature um, that was made called um, Not Me But The Law, and I believe that is 45 minutes, uh, coming up on an hour. Um, and that's another, I mean, that's a prime example of, you know, written, produced, filmed, edited, all by a group of refugees. Um, and that's on the site. The shortest video, um, I mean, well, average. Yeah, the average video is a, we we try and keep them like four to five minutes, um, and you know we might have one that's a minute, like a poem or um, something to that effect. But yeah, they generally fall in the four to five minute range. All right, Thanks. thank you very much, guys. Thanks a lot. Uh, so next up, we have Adrian Sanders of um, Backspaces. Do you need the audio? Adrian Sanders of Backspaces. So um, uh, I don't know about you, but there are all these uh, apps out there that are like really complicated, and Backspaces is not. It's super simple. It does one thing very, very well. Um, it allows people to tell stories with images and text. It's kind of like uh, what, Instagram on steroids. Yeah. Um, so I'll let uh, Adrian explain it a little bit better than I just did. Thanks, Mike. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. Sometimes I talk too quietly into the mic. Um, so my name is Adrian. Um, my co-founder, Dimitri, couldn't make it tonight. Uh, but Dimitri and I built an app called Backspaces. It's an iPhone app. And it's free. So if you have an iPhone and you're so inclined, uh, you can go to back spac.es um, and download from the big call to action button. Um, so yeah, some what basically what we've built is a very simple um, editor that allows you to snap photos or import photos from Instagram, Facebook.
Facebook or your photo library. Drop them into a sequence and then add text anywhere. Um, so I'll show you kind of an example of what that output looks like. Um, well, we'll just do this one. And when you publish it, it goes live onto a link. So here you can see this link here. So when you make a story, it just goes live onto the web. It's also viewable um, on your other social media channels like Facebook, Twitter, uh, and Tumblr. Um, and it links back here. And you know all of this story here, you know title, text, photographs, captions, is all done with the phone. Um, and we built this app. Uh, we actually started working on it last May. Well, it's been a year. Um, we started, we built this app because we felt like a lot of content creation is happening on mobile, but a lot of content creation that's happening on mobile is really vapid. Um, and we were trying to figure out like why are we sort of just like snacking on, you know, images of toast or tweets about, you know, waking up or whatever. Um, and we realized that there wasn't really a mobile tool that was built to actually like help people say more when they wanted to say more. Um, and so, you know, we built it for ourselves first, and then we said, well, let's just see if people are interested. Um, and, you know, we were testing it, and in September, we kind of launched it, but we just, mainly because we ran out of test accounts, we pushed it to the App Store, and it was sort of quietly, you know, trudging along at like a thousand users. And then in December, uh, we presented the New York Tech Meetup, and people started downloading it, and then we got featured, and then there was this whole Instagram terms of service thing that you guys are probably aware of. Uh, and then all of a sudden we had like 15,000 users. And then in the end, actually right at Christmas break, uh, we onboarded like 15,000 users in a day, melted our servers. Um, I, was a, I was in Oregon and Dimitri was in Toronto and we were like, okay, we don't get to celebrate Christmas now because um, we're gonna handle 10,000 support requests. Um, our site went down, all that great stuff where you know you've, you've made it. Um, but what it, it sort of proved to us was that people were kind of looking for this. Um, but what we had no idea about was this massive community of mobile photographers who take what they do very seriously um, and the capacity for people to share really amazing things from their phones. I have to admit I was a little skeptical and jaded about the whole concept. Um, but when we started sort of seeing content like this was the first story called My Dad She uh, by this user Kristen about her transgender father um, that was shared in December. And it's basically an unbelievably honest depiction of what it's like to grow up with a transgender parent. Um, and we realized that, you know, okay, this person has, you know, made this with their phone and they've shared it with our little community um, and they haven't done that before. And you know, we, we reached out, we emailed her, and we were like, tell us how the experience was, you know, tell us what you thought. And she was like, you know, I really just feel like I've been waiting for something to help me tell the story about, you know, my father and I. And this was it. And that's kind of when we realized that, you know, maybe there was something to what we were building. Um, so where are we at now, five months later? Uh, we're at 65,000 users, uh, five million stories. Our stories have been read five million times. Um, we have over 150,000 stories. And our most popular story, uh, my pet mushroom, <laughs> which is a story about a girl going to India, uh, rescuing a dog, and then um, traveling all over the world with it, uh, hit Reddit, and you know drove 100,000 uniques in a day. So, you know, if you ever wondered whether photos of puppies drive page views, the answer is yes. Um, but again, you know, it's, it's kind of like that this, this content for this uh, user, for this girl, is kind of locked up on her phone. And what, how she's able to share it is, you know, spam your Instagram feed, um, add it to the depths of hell of Facebook. Um, you know, or tweet it out to people who are not listening to you. Um, and that's kind of the options you have from your phone. And so, you know, once we opened up, you know, the ability to pull photos from Instagram and Facebook, we just started seeing, you know, this extremely personal content. Um, and because of the nature of typing on a phone, you're not going to write, you know, a, a novel. Uh, but what you are going to do is you're going to really efficiently storyboard out uh, what you're trying to say. Um, 
and you're going to get your point across with the images. And you know, the more we look at stories like this, the more we realize that um, our, as you all, as you all know, in the in the transmedia world, uh, that images that we're becoming a much more uh, visual uh, culture. Um, that in general, communication is becoming extremely visual. Um, and you know, why 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 spend 400 words describing this transition uh, when I can just show you three photos of it? But the problem with I think. Uh, just photos is that they lack context. So here I don't really know, you know, if I just have this image without any sort of caption, it, you know, it loses, I think, a lot of its power. Um, and, you know, again, like, sequence also is, is something that we've identified as being um, incredibly useful uh, for narrative. Um, so, you know, what is this? So this is, you know, you guys can browse. Um, this is on the uh, featured section of Backspaces. So if you go to Backspaces slash featured, um, our sites are all responsive and all that good stuff. Uh, but I wanted to actually uh, include you guys in the story making process. So, um, without further ado, uh, we're going to make a, well, you're going to help me finish the story I've been working on. Uh, so, I'm going to put the mic down. So there you go. 
up. So now it's pushed into the feed. So now you can see uh, my story is there along with the feed of all the other stories of people I'm following. Um, we have hashtags, obviously. Um, we have featured hashtags, which are like topics. So fiction is a really popular one. Um, you know, we get a lot of stories under fiction. Um, we see all sorts of stuff. There's an a Indonesian street photography crew called the Street Bendidos, and they document um, life in Jakarta. Uh, there's a iPhoneography group called We Are Juxt, and they do incredible stories about um, just uh, anything, but mainly a lot of urban exploration, um, a lot of abandoned home stuff, and then a lot of stuff in Seattle where they're based. Um, you know, we have trending and the best of, you know, so we, we try to, the biggest problem that we've had is unearthing all the amazing content because it's literally just Dimitri and I, and when there's like, you know, 2,000 stories being produced every day, um, it's really hard to, you know, we just miss stuff and then I'll be checking on the trending feed and I'm like, oh shit, that's a really good story. Nobody has seen it because this person's new. Um, you know, the stories like this uh, by this guy Brad Pewitt, who's from Juxt, um, you know, for us, I just, I'm not, I wasn't from the mobile photography world, so to see someone, you know, snapping photos like this from their iPhone was, you know, really made me realize, okay, this is, this is pretty serious, the capacity here. Um, and again, because everything is responsive when you share this, it scales up as you saw, um, as you saw on the, uh, on the computer. Um, so, a couple of things I wanted to talk about, because... Um, all that's uh, super good and fun, and I hope you guys check it out. But I think one of the interesting things that we've learned is that this, wake up. No. is that I'm not good with uh, AV stuff. Where 
there's an audience. So a lot of people follow the three photo hype who tag because they've created one and they want to see what other people are doing. Um, and then for a lot of new users to be able to say, oh, you know, I can, I can come up with a haiku um, and I can snap three photos that have some sort of relationship. So that's, that's one of the things that we've focused on. The other thing we focused on is leading with really amazing content. Um, so, you know, for, I'll, t I'll give you an example. Uh, this guy, Sian Falana, he's, is a professional mobile photography guy. And he does a whole storytelling workshop with his husband actually here in the city. Um, but he, you know, he's done things like he went and covered the Mark Carson um, tribute uh, down in the village. Um, and, you know, his ability to kind of capture what's going on, not just with photos, but also with the text, it helps lead the way and sort of set examples for other people in the app who are trying to do similar things. Um, so we feel like it's our job to get these guys as much exposure as we possibly can and put them in touch um, with other people. Um, another good example of a user is uh, Anna Cox, who um, is called Stark Life in our app. Um, you know, people like this, we feel like um, on Instagram, they're actually really big. And this was a funny thing, is when Backspaces first started growing, we would get these users in, and they would immediately have like 100 followers, which was an interesting thing for us. It was immediately sort of a flag to say, hey, who are these people, and how do they have a followers already? And so we would look on Twitter and Facebook, and they would have like 100 followers on Twitter and 50 friends on Facebook. And I was like, who the hell are these people? Mm -hmm. um, but then once we created Connect Your Account with your Instagram account, we realized that um, Instagram is a whole other world. It's a, it is an entirely separate social media world um, that has nothing to do with your sort of social graph of Facebook or your interest graph of Twitter. It's a completely separate graph. Um, so a good example is like Anna, who doesn't have a huge Twitter following, but has 80,000 followers on Instagram. Um, you know, or we saw, for example, this guy, Kochi Hernandez, who, again, on Twitter maybe has a thousand followers, but has a quarter of a million followers on Instagram. Um, and so we obviously, we sat down with these guys and we, you know, we talked with them and we say, hey, you know, what is it, you know, we can't offer you the sort of uh, feedback that um, Instagram can give you. We can't give you a thousand likes or like a thousand comments. And, you know, I literally asked Kochi this and he said, thank God, because, you know, for him, one of the problems now with Instagram is that, you know, 90% of that stuff is spam to him. Um, and, you know, when he's constantly, when he's getting a thousand uh, comments that are like, hey, follow me back, or shout out, selfie, or whatever, um, it's meaningless to him. And so we're starting to see, we're not seeing this massive growth of like 100, like 100 million users, but we are starting to see these sort of, you know, top tier photographers and storytellers on Instagram start to discover us and say, you know, I'm, we're not gonna post on Backspaces every day. We may not even post every week, but like they basically come back whenever they feel like they have something significant. So one of our challenges is, okay, that's super cool for them. Uh, but for us, right, we want them cranking out content every day because that drives growth. Um, so one of our biggest things that we have, we have to figure out now, right, is um, how do you keep something of high quality uh, without um, completely bastardizing it by just, you know, um, right, and, and survive, or on the flip side of that, um, you know, how, how do you not bastardize it by just like pumping out sort of uh, random content that's just going for page views. Um, so again, that's that's kind of, I just wanted to go over a little bit of some of our, our challenges because I think they're interesting challenges for um, for anybody that's interested in storytelling. Um, it's a huge crux of, you know, one of the problems that anybody who's trying to do a, a rich experience or sort of like a deeper experience is, is that if you're trying to get user generated content or even commissioned content and there's no audience, um, you, whatever you have just dies. Um, so for us, like again, it's, it's trying to figure out where, is, where do you walk that line of a, a great uh, engaged audience that keeps creators coming back um, without you know, suffering too much churn or having too much of the wrong sort of audience. Um, that's kind of it as far as I'm concerned. If you guys have any questions, we can open it up. Um, do you, oh, you, I, yeah. uh, do you have an API that developers can work with? 
Not yet. Um, so one thing that we, we do, the, the one thing we have is we have this embed. Um, when we've kind of built this out for bloggers who want to throw this on WordPress or um, things like that, um, we just haven't seen enough demand for an API. Maybe this is the room to pitch that question to. Um, but if we start to see it, I think it's not something that's hard for us to do. Every, everything we do is, um, you know, it, it's, it's relatively simple. We just, um, yeah, it wouldn't be hard. Any other questions? Andrew? Android? <laughs> so Android is the number one question we get. Um, and my number one response to that is that I would love to do Android. I would love also to pay my rent. Um, <laughs> I would love, you know, lots of things. Um, you know, we're two guys, uh, and if we, again, if we see a lot of uh, requests for it, um, then we'll build it. It really is a matter of uh, when, not if. Um, but yeah, I, we have plenty of friends who you know, are using amazing Android phones, exactly, with fantastic uh, cameras, um, but we just, we just don't have the resources for it right now. Any other questions? Do you, I have a but is there a way to integrate audio? So, so the first question with audio and video, kind of, we've actually stayed away from much richer media, which maybe is a um, a bad thing to say here. Uh, but we've just found that um, photos, photos and text are something that like is kind of like a very simple baseline for people. And we've been like just from my personal experience, trying to do things with audio video on the phone is actually pretty difficult to do something of relative quality. Um, I mean, it's hard enough to get people to take a good photo, let alone tell a story. Um, so adding it, we, we've just tried to hone it down on this like one very central experience of just dropping your photos in, which is something you're kind of, the stream format, you know, is similar to like a Tumblr or, um, uh, or an Instagram feed. So, you know, we're trying to be as close as we can to something that you're probably already familiar with. Yeah. Any other questions? <coughs> Thanks, Andrew. Yeah. Uh, okay. So last up is a very special guest, Greg from Jehudi. Greg is uh, part of the team that is uh, has started the Story Code Paris chapter. So we welcome uh, Greg and. Uh, Greg's going to be talking about and presenting an uh, uh, interactive storytelling platform called Jehudi. Um, it basically allows you to do, um, to create you know, rich uh, applications without having to learn code. Um, but it also has a great uh, code export, so if you are working with developers, you can uh, export the code and kind of use it yourself, customize it further. Um, and yeah, so I think with that, I will turn it over to Greg. So welcome, Greg. Thanks. Uh, hi. Uh, so my name is Greg. As like I said, thank you for having us. Uh, it's been a long trip. Uh, so I'm going to present Jehudi. Uh, so it's kind of a weird name. It's actually the name comes from an Egyptian, Egyptian, sorry, an Egyptian god. That's a very the writer. So uh, so the whole concept is that Jehudi is a. Uh, this is a little about the background. So Jehudi was a, uh, actually we all come from a graphic design background and we saw that coding was quite difficult and that the graphic designers and the developers had like different insights. Uh, the graphic designer really wanted to get close to the animation, to the, to the per pixel, uh, so wanted to get really close to what he really wanted. At the end of the code guy is more like I want optimized code, I want it to be really, uh, to work as well and everything. So, uh, from that point of view, we thought that maybe it was, you could like, make a tool that would be just between but the both of them and allow the graphic designer to already integrate all the interface. And, uh, and so that's when we actually invented Jihudi. Uh, so Jihudi is a cloud software. The idea is that uh, you can just get online, start creating. You can create for all platforms. I mean, it's going to be really a... Uh, Easy to, easy to handle software. Uh, you want it. Sorry, to myself. English is not my main language, so. <laughs> Take your time. Yeah. Uh, 
So it's just actually just going to be able to create your experiences and really do whatever you want. What we really want to do is have PA have uh, the idea is the important part. We didn't want the the tool to restrict what the people could do, as you can see in other tools. So it's really like a blank page, and then you can really give it you give it the basic bricks. You can just build whatever you want. Uh, so to do that, we uh, uh, so it's uh, to do that we started with. Uh, Basic, basic drag and drop to have into these interactions, a timeline to, to manage interactive videos and stuff like that. And uh, I shall to show you just quick go to this. Maybe show them more what it's about. You want to create your own documentary, interactive video, your dynamic graphics, your website, or your Facebook page without a single line of code? Jehudi is for you. With Jehudi, everything happens in the cloud. Log on Jehudi.com. Start creating and sharing fascinating interactive experiences right now. In an intuitive interface, you can create your project mixing all types of medias. Enlighten your article with an interview. Complete your YouTube hosted video with an interactive map. With Jehudi, easily create interactivity. Start a sound. Set the appearance of the menu. Offer your users links, bonuses, or anything that comes out of your mind. Design real-time rich media and publish them within a click. Your projects are in HTML5 and visible on all devices and browsers. Start creating now. Join us on jehudi.com. That actually wraps it up. That's easier. <laughs> sense of what it does. Uh, what the users we have today, so we've been existing for two and a half years in France. Uh, we have all kinds of users, it goes from photographers, designers, journalists, directors, <coughs> students take, uh, take the tour in France too. Uh, and our mainstream, we've been in beta, in private beta for a year, but we actually work with most of uh, the medias in France. So we have radios, we have TV, uh, we have national to the radios, national TV, we have uh, museums, we have magazines, we have all kinds of people. And they really use it to enhance the user experience on, on their websites. Uh, the idea is that the journalists and the, the, the journalist photographic designers can really build up quick experiences, mix all kinds of media, and have, them, have the user have a, a more fulfilling experience online. Uh, and, um, So what we're looking to, to, what we've seen in two years, that when we used to have a big team for people to do web documentaries or iDots, uh, now they can actually send up to only two people, so graphic designer and journalist. The graphic designer will imagine all the interface, all the animations, and the journalist will just fill in with the content. Uh, it's quite interesting because it's sort of on the cloud, uh, it's just on the cloud. We've had experience with like people, uh, the journalist will be in Africa, the graphic designer will be in back in Paris, we we'll just upload his videos on the platform and then the graphic designer just can take them back and just do whatever he wants with them. So it's, uh, it can really shorten up the time of production and it's really it's an interesting way of what an interesting way of working. Uh, we also work a lot with uh, small uh, independent journalists that are trying to get up and have some medias outside. So, uh, in France, we have lots of help from the States, thanks God, for, to, for that kind of, of, uh, of medium. Uh, but even though we have the big medias that just take the content and maybe just like they, they, they won't give a lot of money, they say well, we'll have it online, so that's enough. So lots of people are not making that much money. So we're looking for new ways of, uh, for them to monetize. So we just uh, came out with the possibility to export apps, uh, Android and App Store uh, apps directly from Jihudi. So you can just take your storytelling and just drag it onto the App Store. You have to have a license and everything that's that we can turn into it for, for it. And we're always, we work really closely to the people that work on our software, so it's uh, a constant back and forth. We love feedback. We love to be able to, uh, to have the new functionality that people want to have, and really work hand-to-hand -hand with, our, with the, our users. So what does it do? Uh, I'm going to show you a little uh, like demo of what, all the different projects. You'll be able to see them on our blog. Uh, and then I'll talk to you what we're going to right now, actually, afterwards. <coughs>
stuff you can do with Jody. What we really wanted to show you is that you can really have a wide range of, uh, of, pro of different interfaces. There's nothing out of the box. We actually came back to doing some templates now because some people are just afraid of the white page and need to go quicker. But you can actually build whatever comes out of your mind and then you can actually build a template of that and maybe like reuse it for different purposes uh, for which would be really useful when you're big media. So you can have like the main teams that are capable with graphic designers to build interfaces and then the other ones can just quickly fill them up and reuse them to make series of stuff like that. Um, So then I can show you a little how it's made, uh, how, so how GUI works actually. So uh, this is the, our first version, it's 1.4. Uh, we're going to launch the second version in September. And we're actually building a whole platform to go around it to, be, to have uh, people uh, make all kind of interactive content and be able to, to, uh, to take it out to the public and share it and whatever. Uh, so basically GUI is made in three parts. We're going to have uh, projects in area media. The media part is already just going to upload all your files, so it's going to be quite easy because it converts all the files for you. So you're going to be able to put a .av, .move, it's just going to make all, all the videos for you. Uh, that's, that's, uh, <laughs> that's nice when you know how it's it is to get uh, the media everywhere. That's the whole thing. Uh, you have the boring part. It's going to be where you're going to have to uh, get all your settings ready for your project. So it's your size, it's going to resize. You're going to be able to upload your custom custom fonts, so you can use really uh, native uh, funky fonts in your project, so that the, the search engine can still see them. Uh, you can configure. We have, as I told you before, we have to come from a background of graphic designer, so you can use letter spacing, line height, word spacing. Graphic designers in the room, they can all <laughs> nice. uh, And then you have the configure the scroll bar, so you have an ugly gray bar you know, on the right on the PC, as well PC and stuff like that. One important thing, we're made for mass media, so we actually are compatible from IE7, uh, IE8, IE9, Firefox 3, up to tablets, smartphones, uh, iPhone, Android, everywhere. Uh, and then you have the basic, well, the real, the hard JOD, uh, so it's going to be uh, the editor. So in the editor, you're just going to have, you know, this is what we call the scenario, it's where you're going to actually mine your, your tree. Be able to create all your pages, all the buttons, all the gray spots you see under there are like the, page, the buttons on the page. So we're easily going to be able to link a page to another uh, like this, so you can actually build your whole, uh, your whole, uh, your whole tree. Uh, once you get in, a, in the editor, so I'll, I have some pre-built page, and then I'll start some from some scratch. So we basically have a look and feel of a PAO. I don't know if you say that in English, PAO is like a Photoshop or GIMP uh, kind of look and feel. So you're, if you're Used to those kind of pro programs, you can be quite at your ease. Uh, so you're actually going to be able. So you have your properties, you have your, your objects. Here you have your. Wait, this is where you're going, sorry. Up there is where you're going to create all your objects. So you have what we call hot links. They're like transparent interaction spots that are, you're just going to be able to like take a family picture, put a picture of a hot spot, and everyone have interaction on that. You can go on a movie too. We have a timeline that can track movies. That's quite interesting. Uh, so everything's in drag and drop, so uh, you know you can resize. Uh, so you can resize. You can have a, you know, all the all the Photoshop stuff, um, Control Z, and everything. It's uh, it's good it's software. Um, you can build. You can bring in your your images. So, <laughs> Yeah, that's from the, the, the images you just uploaded. Uh, this is our basic, basic, our basic engine. Uh, we're now working on, on tons of plugins. We have Twitter, Facebook, and Slideshow for the moment, but for until September, we have like, I think, five to ten more, which include Flickr and all those kinds of things, so uh, for you to easily add content. What were the first three you said? Uh, uh, Facebook, Twitter, the share for Facebook, uh, the tweet to share a page too, and a Slideshow. Yeah, because we, yeah, we really saw that People really, it's at the common use and you really want to have that. So I'll just show you the slideshow like, and then I'll get back to the rest of things. Uh, so the slideshow, it's still it's me the same. I'm just going to drag and drop. Just go this way. Uh, so you're just going to resize your slideshow. Uh, everything's the same thing. So you have your properties for every. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wait. Uh, 
you have your properties where you can actually uh, so set all your image opacity, rotation, and whatever. So in this slideshow, we're just going to add some pictures in. So you just add in your pictures. You're just going to have your settings, say if you want to auto start, time slide, if you want to see thumbnails, pagination, uh, all kinds of stuff, you can change your order. Uh, and I just, I've just updated it in my slideshow's notes. So I can just really, it's quite easy to do. And then you have all the actions. So the actions is, uh, you can put them on all kinds of elements, but I'll just show you like on this one. So I'm just going to actually going to, okay, take this element, say I want to have an action on a click. I'm going to add an action and go ahead and uh, say, okay, I want the, uh, let's see what I have here. Uh, menu background to move, I can choose, choose what kind of uh, property it's going to move to. That's one French property, let's uh, I can choose a time, I can put an effect to it, I can use, I can, uh, I can use the back button. So back button can actually do the reverse action. It's just going to go the other way around when I double every click on it. For a rollover, we roll out. Uh, I can don't take my text. Then I'll take my hot link. So I can just apply, I can just take my different layers. basic bricks, but then when we have that in mind, you can actually build all kinds of stuff uh, with my slideshow when we're going through. All my demos are actually, actually end up really ugly. <laughs> There's some cool stuff in it too, and I'm just showing you the basics. Uh, and then you have uh, the timeline. So the timeline is quite cool. I think I actually have an example. You can bring in Vimeo, uh, YouTube, Vimeo, and, and uh, Daily Motion movies inside. Uh, Daily Motion is quite big, you can find some here. So you can actually, uh, like I can just open, like go to an image, so I have like this, I import this Vimeo image, I have five images under it, and I have an action on, on this page, on this image, sorry, and it just goes, uh, sorry. that just tells the movie to go to uh, the first minute, so I, that's like I actually chapter my, my movie really easily, if I preview it, I can just, First minutes, so she's not that great. And you can just chapter your movie and have it play automatically. So that's quite nice too. Uh, Should have done this. What do you mean? Chapter? Like, you can click on like the second chapter. Yeah, you can actually yeah just like cut your movies into pieces. That's one example, but then. That's one of those examples. Yeah, you can like, click on the second image and go to a special, a specific part of the screen. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay, so. Um, so that's the kind of stuff you can do. And then I'll, go, I'll get back to my timeline, actually, if I have an example of that. So I can just take, actually, like a... Uh, so I'll just... Go back to my page. Oh. And actually, I have an extra way to compare this. <laughs> uh, the idea of the timeline is that so you're going to be able to, like I said, to, to follow a movie. So you, when you upload one of your movies, I won't upload it here because because of the, the Wi-Fi. But you can you're going to be able to uh, really animate your elements uh, through the time. So like if I just go down here, I want this block to be over here and to be. Uh, this why and I can I can put my my audience and stuff and have interaction on my videos. Uh, it's quite easy, and then it just builds up, it just does it does a transition. So it's that's quite easy to, to play with. And so you can actually the example we always give has had like a 
maybe a fashion show and just track the people and have like all the clothes and then you have where they're from uh, or stuff like that. It's, uh, or an interview and have more information on the person and composite it in the video. Uh, if you go to our blog, you have tons of examples. Uh, mostly they're in French right now, so we're looking forward to it. We have the, our, our video version is open, so you can just log on to a site, ask for us, and we'll give you access to our platform. And you can really start playing with it. We have tutorials, we have all kinds of stuff. And uh, uh, GOD.com. So GOD, I'll just go back to the presentation. It's easier to say French. I think we'll have to change the name for you. <laughs> about that, so it's actually. Uh, Make us work. Yahoo. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's right now beta and it's free for us to access. No, actually, we've been out for uh, two years, oh, a year and a half. Uh, we've um, we have pricings and stuff like that. We, we you have free, you can have a free free project depending on how much shows you're going to use, how much pages you're going to have, how much media you're going to upload. Uh, so it can go from a really free plan up to it can go like professional plan where you're going to take off our brands and stuff like that. And uh, it can go up the price, depending on what projects we have. And then we actually are a graphic design agency and an interactive agency, so we can have, so we have services and specific developments. We can have those for you. And, uh, but so yeah, we're going back to beta this summer, not for the tool, the tools will stay almost the same, we're just going to rescan and have a new look and feel. Because uh, we need to take a little time, it's been two years we've been like looking at the it's really intense, and uh, so we're going to take a sit back and just re re redesign the whole interface, the whole look and feel, and we're building the whole platform that goes around for it, so you can be able to share with your friends or video interactives, uh, uh, all kinds of stuff, interesting stuff. Uh, yeah. How do you how do you test what it will look like on a phone? Okay, for the, uh, the phone, for the moment we have like a resize. It's going to be a more technical resize. Uh, instead of the September version, you have, you have a responsive. Mm -hmm. So then you'll be able really, really to decide uh, how to see exactly it's going to look on a different phone or something like that. For the moment we have a just a home tech, do you say that? Home you know, it's like a constraint resize. Uh, but we've seen that most of our projects work actually, even on the iPhone. It's, uh, Technically it works, but it's, it's how you're going to build it, how, what, what type of fonts you're going to use, and stuff like that, that might be the problem. But usually you can still, the project you can see on the iPhone is not the really problem up to today. You'll be able to change the fonts and all this other stuff in the new version? You, you can already do, yeah, what you'll be able, what you'll be able to do is to reaccommodate your, your, your feed, your, your yeah. medias for yeah. different devices, and you know, high, high actions. Yeah, two questions. Uh, one is, is there a way to use it with templates for, as a low threshold for uh, non-designers? Yeah, that's what we're building in the platform, actually. We're building a template store. And a store doesn't mean to all be uh, really costly, most people will be free and everything. Uh, we're building a template store and we're building a plugin store. So actually, we're building the API too, so that maybe the developers can build uh, specific uh, plugins on it. And uh, yeah, our idea is really, because we really saw that some people just can't afford to have a graphic designer on a project or just uh, don't want to, and they still have good ideas. And so we really are, that's what we're building the template store. And how soon will you have the training videos and everything else? In we already have on the platform, this yes for a beta. Right. Now, how soon will they be in English? Uh, in English. Uh, we actually already have the whole platform ready in English, it's beta version, so there's our tutorials and all that kind of things. Okay. Uh, and then we've had a bunch of experiences with all kinds of people, students, journalists, uh, people that have no, no background in graphic designs or anything. And they usually, depends, you know, it depends, but usually like in half a day a day, they'll get the grasp of it, and they'll be really able to build something. When I have students uh, journalists in school, I have like a four-day course, two days are theoretical, and then one day is on Geoli, and the last day they've already built something. So it's, uh, it's quite nice to see how easy it is to take, to take over. A couple questions about like, what's integrated. Uh -huh. um, like, I was just curious about data, and yeah. like, if, like, are, are we able to collect data, and what is the output like with okay. that? And, Uh, today, once you export it, it's going to be static HTML and JavaScript. So we don't, we don't take any uh, the bad. The, the editor is made with PHP, uh, database, and all that kind of thing. But then, 
when searching for it, it's just going to be static HTML or JavaScript. Uh, today we don't use any, uh, our plugins are going to do that, are going to be able for you to recover. We have a, we made a project called Monocracy, uh, where it's, it's made by Geralt. Uh, it's actually a serious game, so we have a, we have a plugin that actually allows you to have like variables, and so the user can make choices, what points, uh, all, all kinds of stuff. Uh, so it's more like the plugins are going to do that, but it's not, uh, it's not the, the basics. What we what, what we really what we're really really looking for, sorry, is for uh, the export to be able. We want we do not want to put the project in a box and say that you can't do something. So the basic idea is once that you export it, we're going to give you all the clean, the clean code. It's actually as clean as if I've coded it, so it's uh, it's uh, it's okay. <laughs> and so you can have another coder just come inside and do the specific stuff you want to do inside. Specific, I don't know, whatever you can imagine, whatever Jiri cannot do today, you can have somebody just run it, get inside, do clean the code screen, and just build some stuff. You do that for my friend Gallup, do your own data visualization, but you wouldn't be able to do that with it. You can, you can import uh, embeds from most programs and stuff like that if you're looking for data this, uh, Storyfy, all kinds of stuff. Uh, yeah, you can, import, you can import stuff from all kinds of, all the corners of the web, just like enhance them and animate them. Did I answer your question? Is that? Yeah. yeah. I have another one, but I don't want to monopolize it. Go for it. Go for it. I mean, I'm sure it's of interest too. I mean, when like Vimeo often is introducing this like pay for video, uh, I don't know if it's like that. I've been introduced already. So I'm just wondering if that integration is, do you use that? Yeah. Because actually it's just the same player, they actually just put the, they block it from inside, uh, from what I've seen. Uh, so actually, yeah, you could actually just have a, a whole part, maybe you have like a whole movie, you can just block it. And actually when you're using the timeline to track, uh, if the movie doesn't go, you can, have, you can, have, you can put a, media, a master media, so if the connection goes down or if the media doesn't start, it won't start. So as long as you won't be able to read the, the movie, pay it on the email or, or whatever, the, the animation won't go. So it'll, like I've never used it. Has anybody used the pay? Has anybody I think bought it? I've never used it yet. <laughs> on Vimeo? I, you know, so I'm just wondering if it's going to take you off your site or whether that would be. No, I don't think so. I, 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 I imagine it's kind of like a, like the same player you can embed, but except you won't, go, you won't get direct access. You're going to have to like put a card in or like have a number in or something like that to have right. points to get into that. But it's, I haven't really checked that out actually, but it should not be a problem because I guess you can still embed it because it won't stop the possibility to embed it. So then it's what you do with it inside your list. I mean, that's very interesting. I mean, it's all very interesting. Yeah. But I mean, having something where you have like video locks or something that, you know, it's 50 cents or something. Yeah. What we've been working on is, uh, sorry, okay. What we've seen is that uh, the app is a good way to monetize a project if you can have like a, a journalist project and a journalist. Uh, it's good for them to like have a good teaser online so you can get the people's interest and then like send them to the app store or the market and maybe they're asked for little contributions, have extra content, and that's a good way of monetizing. Still, all the interactive that, that we have in Jiri directly on the iPad is, is kind of nice, and then are all kinds of tablets, smartphones. So, uh, for us, for monetizing a project, that's what, what we recommend today. <coughs> because, uh, as I was telling you, can with the Vimeo thing, you can you can stop the timeline, but you won't you won't be able to stop the whole wrap and the whole the whole page and everything that's going to be around it. Any more questions? <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, all right, so we're going to wrap things up. Um, and just a quick announcement. So next month's uh, forum will feature the group from Awkward Hug. Jim Babb and the gang will be presenting um, their photo sharing game called Bow, which is a very cool and hilarious game. So uh, see you next month. Thanks for coming. Bye.